last five, but it's only going to be the last three, are on um, multivariable systems. So the idea here is that um, instead of having a single output, a single input U, so here's our process, P, let's call it. Okay. So instead of having a single input U and a single output Y, we'll consider the case where we have you know, potentially many inputs and many outputs. Okay? And we want to figure out how to use these inputs to control these outputs. So it's the same thing we've been talking about, it's just bigger scale. Okay? So I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll go quickly through an example where we drive a, a transfer function model for a system with more than one input and output. And the main point here is to talk about three. Okay? So the idea here is that the approach we're going to pursue Let's say we had a system that looked like this. So we have three inputs and we have three outputs. The, the approach we're going to pursue, which was what you did on your homework assignment, is I'm going to use one of these inputs to control one of these outputs. Okay? So basically pair these together. You know, like U1, Y1, U2, Y2, U3, Y3. And I'm going to design a controller for each of those. Okay? And I'm going to design a controller for this pair U1, Y1, assuming U1 only affects Y1. But in reality, it affects Y2 and Y3. And because of that, when you design each controller individually and then put them together, they tend to interact with each other. Okay, and these interactions can be kind of negligible or substantial or, or devastating, <laughs> depending on the situation. So that's what I'm trying to introduce here. And the next lecture is, is intended to get you to uh, be able to mitigate those interactions by proper selection of how you do this pairing. Okay? And then I'll talk a little bit about stability of these multivariable systems, and then I'll give you a little example of um, in Simulink. Okay, so I already did this to a great degree. So this is what we focused on primarily up there, which is um, more than w one input and one output. So we call that single input, single output, or CISO. We sometimes call that. And so that's been the, pretty much the sole focus. You know, we had var variations of this, like you know, cascade control and feed forward control and things like that. For the, for the most part, though, we're talking about this. Okay. All right. So um, for most problems that you actually encounter in the real world, they look maybe something more like this. You know, multiple. In this case, this has two inputs and two outputs, but in general, it'll look more like this: lots of inputs and lots of outputs. Okay. And so the, the lecture I'll do the final day of class will give you some feeling for, you know, the complexity involved in addressing maybe more realistic problems. Okay. Um, so these are called multiple input, multiple outer, sometimes we call these MIMO. Um, and the problem here is that, so you take this, we're going to focus a lot on this two by two system, two inputs, two outputs. The, the problem here is the input U1 here will typically affect U Y1 and Y2 as will U2. Okay? So if we use U1 to control Y1, unfortunately, it'll also affect Y2. And as a result of that, um, we'll have certain interactions between the two controllers which will end up being um, problematic, potentially. So this multi, what I call multi-loop or sometimes called decentralized control is the idea of that. So if you have the system, si simple system here, you're going to use one of these inputs to control one of the outputs and the other input to control the other output. There's only two possibilities here, right? U1 to control Y1 and U2 to control Y2 or the other, the other way around, okay? And the idea is we'd like to do this pairing of these variables, select which input you use to control which output to try to minimize these interactions between the controllers, okay? And that's what we talk about next time. So the point today is just to show you what these interactions, what I mean by interactions, and the next time I'll show you methods to actually try to minimize those interactions. Okay? So this is kind of divide and conquer strategy. Just pair the variables together and then do exactly what you did before, just do it more times. So in this case you do it two times, in this case you do it n, n times. Okay? So we'll focus a lot on the two by two case because it's easier, but same principles apply to bigger systems. All right, so here's um, a couple of examples, Simp well, the first one's particularly simple. So what do we want to do here? So we've got blending two streams, so what we'd like to do is blend them such we get a total flow rate, a desired total flow rate and desired mass fraction, let's say, of, the, of the, one of the components. Um, 
And so if I asked you which one of these flows should be used to control the, you know, which one of these inlet flows, so this is pure A and pure B, let's say, which one of these should be used to control the total flow and which one should be used to control the composition, the answer would be I have no idea. <laughs> At least that's be my, my feeling. Okay? All right. Let's say you had a distillation column, which I know you guys are familiar with at this point. How does your, when are your design projects do, by the way? Tuesday? <laughs> Somebody just mo <laughs> No one wants to really admit it. Okay, Tuesday. All right, so we got this column here. And so what are we going to do here? Well, let's say that we have, we're going to manipulate the reflux, and we're going manip to manipulate the steam flow to the reboiler, right? This creates liquid going down the column. This creates vapor going up the column. And so um, these are the two manipulated variables, and we want to control the, the distillate and the bottom's composition of this column. Um, I say based on physical intuition, it's not hard to, to reason that you probably want to use the reflux to control the distillate and the steam to control the bottoms. Why do I know that? Because those things are physically close to each other, right? So if I change the reflux, that'll have a quick effect on the distillate, and if I can change the steam that have a quick effect on the bottoms. Of course, I could consider the other case, right? I control the bottom p composition with the reflux, so if I change the reflux, right, that'll propagate down the column and eventually c change the bottoms. That's probably not a good idea, though. All right? But even if I come up with this pairing, which will make the most sense, um, there'll, be, there'll tend to be a lot of interactions between these controllers, right? So if this controller um, adjust the steam rate to control the bottom's composition. That'll change the amount of vapor going up the column and eventually that'll be up here in the overhead circuit and that'll change the distillate. Okay? And then this column will see distillate changing and it'll change the reflux to compensate and eventually that'll change the bottoms. So these controllers will tend to interact with each other. Okay, flash drum. I, I assume everyone knows what a flash drum is. We, I think I've talked about it before. But the idea here is you take a, you take a, you heat up a stream, you expand it into a drum, you create vapor coming off, and you create a liquid. It's a way to usually do a preliminary separation before a column, or sometimes you use this to get rid of really heavy stuff, right? Because if you if you have stuff that's really heavy, like hydrocarbons, then you can get that, you can separate this into a vapor stream and a liquid stream, and then process these two streams separately. All right. So, what would you like to control here? Well, you'd like to control, um, let's say, the pressure here. Why pressure? Because the pressure here will affect the VLE of the separation. And so you might want to fix the pressure so you get some control reproducible separation of, these t of this stream. And then you also want to control the level, right? Because you have some control of the inventory in this drum to make sure you have liquid in there. And so what can you manipulate? Well, you manipulate the gas and liquid flow com coming off of this drum, okay? So if someone asked you, hopefully you have enough intuition about control at this point, if somebody asked you, I want to control the pressure, the, the, the pressure, should I use the flow of the gas or should I use the flow of the liquid? The answer would be, I bet the gas has a more direct, the flow of gas has a more direct uh, effect on the pressure than does the liquid, right? I mean, and same thing here. If you said, I want to change the liquid level, well, of course, if you pull more gas off of here, then, you know, you'll, the VLE will be such that you'll, you'll vaporize more and the level will change, but it's not a very good way to do it, right? The direct way to do it is just change the liquid flow right there. Okay. Um, and so I mentioned here the main effect will be um, that if you change the... Um, gas flow, that's going to tend to eventually change the, the liquid, right? And so the, the problem there is, again, use the gas flow, control the pressure, that's fine. But when you do so, you'll say take more gas off of here. Should be called vapor probably, but anyway. More vapor off of here, that'll change the pressure all right, but it'll also um, cause more gas to vaporize. will change the liquid, and then this controller will have to, okay, compensate. So the, the point of these examples is, number one, if you have even pretty simple control problems, it may or may not be easy to know how to pair the variables together. In this case, it was kind of obvious based on physical arguments. In this case, not. But even if one does know how to pair the variables in some reasonable way, um, 
you have to recognize these controllers, once designed and both turned on at the same time, are going to interact with each other. So we have to have some way of characterizing when this interaction is going to be a problem, okay, and trying to minimize it. Oh. Goes wrong way. All right, so I'm going to go through this example quickly because um, it's not the core principle, but I just wanted to make sure that we could do something like this. So, so I'm giving you this physical example. This is the favorite example of the book, the old stir tank heater. Right? You put in two streams and then they mix together and then a stream comes out. Right? And the stream comes out um, at some flow rate and some temperature. So what I want to control here is um, the level in the tank so I have some inventory of liquid in there and I also want to control the, the temperature coming out because the whole goal of the process is to <laughs> mix two streams to get a desired temperature. And I can do this by manipulating the flow of the co cooler stream and the flow of the, the hotter stream. Okay. So what I aspire to do, because everything we do is based on transfer functions, I want to get a tr transfer functions that relate those two inputs to those two outputs. Okay. So if you have a transfer function between one input and out one output, you have one transfer function. But if you, if you want to know how each of those two inputs affects each of those two outputs, you need four transfer functions. Okay. One between each input and each output. So that's what I'm going to do here, but I'm going to do it quickly. I'm going to skip some steps, but at least outline the procedure. It's nothing different than we've done before, right? So first thing we're going to do is look at this system and write balance equations. So the first thing we do is write an overall mass balance. It looks like that, right? That should be pretty obvious. Accumulation, those are the two flows in, that's the flow out. Then we write energy balance, right? Using reference temperature for the enthalpy here. So there's the accumulation of energy in the tank, right? It has to do with the volume of the tank, density of fluid. <laughs> C here is the heat capacity. I don't know why I didn't put CP, which you would normally do, but anyway, that's what C is, heat capacity. This is flow of energy in the inlets, two inlet streams, right? Hot stream and cold stream, and this is the amount of enthalpy leaving as we remove fluid there. So no, there's nothing new about this. Okay. So we know that when we have... Well, if we don't know, I'm going to tell you that what I want to do with this model is I want to get two differential equations that for the two things I want to control. So I want one for the level, right? That's going to come from here, obviously, and I want one from the temperature, which will come from here. Okay? So this one is easy enough to get, right? Rho is assumed to be constant. This is a cylindrical tank, right? So the volume is A times H. So you can pull out rho and you can pull out a and then you can divide through and get that. I mean, that's, dare I say, trivial. All right, well, this part here is a little more complicated. So you have, um, I'm just going to do the, the left-hand side. So first of all, again, we have rho and we have b and you can pull those out. Well, sorry, I meant you can pull rho and you can pull c, density, heat capacity. And then you have this derivative here, and it's what, V, and then Okay, you can't pull either of these out of the derivative, right? Because V is a function of H, and H changes with time, and T obviously changes with time. So you have to use the product rule here. So, so what do you get? V. So V times the derivative of T minus T ref, well T ref's a constant, so that's just T, so you get that. And then you get T minus T ref times the derivative of V. Okay? So just expanding that derivative using the product rule. Okay, so, and you know this thing here, you know what this derivative is, right? Because you just wrote what it is there dv dt is just this divided by rho. I mean, it's right there, right? Pull the rho, divide. Then you've got to substitute that thing in there to eliminate it, okay? And then you'll have an equation where the only derivative is dt dt. Sounds redundant, but it's not. And then you do the algebra, and eventually you'll end up with this, okay? 
So if you don't believe me, you can, you can do it. But that's the procedure. Expand this derivative, substitute in for this equation, solve for dt, the derivative of temperature, you get this equation here. OK. This is exactly the equation we want because on the left-hand side are the derivatives for the two outputs, and on the right-hand side are the two inputs, wh and wc. OK. Who wants to guess what we do now? Uh, someone must want to guess, right? We have to do something with this equa these equations. <laughs> we could throw them away, right? Like what? Like you like throwing them away? Okay, well that, that's, th that, that may be an option you prefer, but it's not actually the right answer is the thing. Um, <coughs> so let me ask you a question. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to hold your hand. Are these equations linear or nonlinear? No. <laughs> right? Because they're, they're, this equation is linear, right? But this equation is not linear. It's not linear for two reasons. Number one is you divide by h right there. That makes it nonlinear. And then you also have these bilinear terms, right? That's an output multiplied by the inputs. So that's a u times y term. That's a 1 over y term. Th that's nonlinear. So first thing you have to do is, is the old finest steady state and linearize. You can see why I'm skipping a lot of steps. But none of the steps I'm skipping are, are very um, interesting, OK? So here's my proposition. If I take that equation and I linearize it, oops, that's a really bad DT there. I'll end up with, let me see here. <coughs> I have to look at this equation carefully. I don't want to, so. So W here is, a, is assumed to be constant. So unless I'm really dumb, which is possible, um, this will look something like a constant, which I'll call this for reasons I'll explain, oops, times WC, and another constant time, and I'll explain these constants in a moment, times WH. This is my, this is my claim. If I linearize that first equation about some steady state, because you can see on the, on the right hand side here, there's not T and there's not H, right? The only thing on the right-hand side are these two things. This is going to drop out when we, li when we linearize because that's a constant there, okay? In fact, we don't need to guess what that equation will look like if you don't want to, if you're not comfortable with that. You can see by inspection that it's going to look like uh, 1 over rho, and then it's going to uh, have a, a WH prime plus a WC prime. It's going to be exactly that. It's, it's already linear. Just, you just got to get the deviation form of it. And because W is constant, it's going to drop out. Oh, and there's an A here. Sorry. Because volume is A times H. All right. Now, for this equation, even I can't, by inspection, look at this equation and see what it's going to exactly look like when I linearize it, but, or this equation. But I can see on the right-hand side, there's a term involving H. T is over here. WH and WC are over here as well. So it's going to look like <coughs> So there's going to be uh, I'm, not, I'm trying to think if I want to call the constants any particular thing. No, it doesn't matter. So I'm just going to call it a constant A times H prime, another constant B times T prime, another constant C times WH prime, and some constant D times WC prime. Okay, that's what it's going to look like. I don't know what the constants A, B, C, and D are until I find the steady state linearize and evaluate the partial derivatives for those terms. But it's, it's going to have that form, okay? Now once it has this form, okay, then I'm confident that you could find, you could take the Laplace transform of these equations, right? They're, they're, they're obviously linear. So you can take the Laplace transform of these two equations and when you take the Laplace transform of the two equations, the goal is to, well, let's see where I, where I left off here. Impressive. Okay. So when 
you take the Laplace transform of this equation, obviously you're going to get a 1 over s term. And all you got to do is divide by that and you'll get, you'll get the first equation up there, right? Because there's, 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 no, there's nothing interesting over here like h or t. So you just get a 1 over s, you get an s term here. When you take a Laplace transform, you divide by that and you'll immediately get that first thing up at the top. Now this, the other one's not so easy to see, but um, so obviously when you take the Laplace transform of this equation, then you're going to have, right, this term is going to get h prime of s, and this one's going to give you a t prime of s, um, and you're going to need to bring that thing over here, right? I mean, you know, that's just the same algebra we always do. And then for this thing here, you're going to substitute in from the other equation, and then you're going to have an equation that involves um, just t, wh, and wc, and when you do the algebra, it's going to look like that. You're going to trust me on this one. Okay? All right. And tau is defined there. Tau is um, basically the residence time, right? <coughs> because it's, uh, it's the mass of fluid divided by the mass flow rate, so the residence time. All right, so there you have it. You got your two outputs on the left, and then you have your two inputs on the right, and the th you have four transfer functions, right? You have transfer function relating each of the inputs to each of the outputs. <coughs> Dare I say, I lost my pointer, one, two, three, four of them. Where'd it go? That's weird. Oh, there it is. Okay. Now, because I have more than one input and one, one, more than one output, it's convenient to write this thing in vector matrix form, right? Because we like to do that if we don't have <laughs> scalars. So I'm going to define a vector of outputs. It's H prime and T prime. They're stacked on top of each other. Okay. And then I have a vector of inputs over here, WH and WC. And then the, this matrix is what the transfer functions that relates these things, okay? So for example, w, this just says that H prime equals that thing times WH plus that thing times WC. It's that equation right there, okay? And this equation, <coughs> excuse me, second one says T prime equals this this thing times WH and this thing times WC, it's this, that equation. Just a convenient way of writing the same thing. Okay, we call this thing a transfer function matrix. Okay, so it's a matrix of transfer functions that relates the input, sorry, the outputs and the inputs. Okay, it's just a multivariable generalization of just one transfer function, it's just four. It's nothing, it's not a big deal. <laughs> okay, all right. So if I, if I claim to have the transfer function matrix for a problem. You know, in many problems when we've done before, I just give you a transfer function, right? I just say, here's your G, right? I just give it to you. How do you actually get a G? You go through this procedure. If I give you a transfer function matrix for some problem, I just give it to you. How would you actually get that? You would get it like this, right? <laughs> but some problems, we, I start by giving you this, and then you proceed to do other things, just like in the other case. But you can, you can derive these, all right? And that's how you do it for that example. Not, not too difficult. If you want to study for the final, which I would recommend, um, all things being considered, you could, you could just work through the details of that example if you like. All right. So, generally speaking, the problem I just gave you can be written like this. So we have our two outputs. So this is the general representation, y1 and y2. And then we have two inputs, u1 and u2, and this is the transfer function matrix for that problem, for any problem, okay? So, you know, we start having subscripting issues here because we have more than one input and output. So first of all, we put p there to represent the process transfer function because we always have all these transfer functions floating around, although I admit sometimes we'll just call that g without the p. Okay, so the first subscript corresponds to what output you're talking about, and the second one is what input you're talking about. So this transfer function relates the second input to the first output, and so on. Okay? And I thought, if you're having trouble understanding that, then you'd certainly enjoy this one, right? This is the most general case of all. It's where you have as many inputs as you want, and as many outputs as you want. Okay? 
and it's a subscripting nightmare you probably don't want to get into. Well, it's not a nightmare, but it's not so much fun, but it's just a generalization of this to any number you want. So for most of the problems we're going to talk about, in fact, I think almost all of them, we're going to assume that we have the same number of inputs as outputs, right? So this is two each, this is n each, where n is any number you want, okay? But we'll assume they're the same. And generically, we'll write it like this, okay? So, so when you see the bold face, right, from 361, that means th these are vectors and matrices. So this means a vector of outputs, vector of inputs, matrix of transfer functions. All right? Okay, so we're gonna, the good news is we're going to focus a lot on this case because problems that I can give you, especially on a test, are hard to do if I give you a 4x4 four four problem. <laughs> it just becomes too onerous. So we'll learn how to develop methods kind of for the most general case, usually, but we'll tend to, the examples will tend to be simple 2x2 two two problems like that. All right. So... All right, so what is this? This is a control system, um, the kind of two alternatives you would have for a two by two control system. So it doesn't quite look like your homework, right? Because in this case, in, your ca in the homework you did, you had to, in, Mat in Simulink, you had to build the process to be an S function <coughs> instead of a transfer function. But if, if your process could be represented as transfer functions, then you could have done exactly this. So let's take a look at this. So what are we saying here? So take the output Y1, compare it to its set point, generate an error signal, put that through a controller, we're going to have two of them, and the way this controller works is that you're using U1 to control Y1, so that's why U1 operates on the air, E1, okay? And then this U1 goes through two transfer functions, right? Because if you go back and you look at the equations, well, there it is, right there. Y1, um, so what is this? This say this says y1 equals that thing times u1 plus that thing times u2. And that's all that's represented in this block diagram. Okay. So if we look at what y1, it's u1 going through that transfer function and u2 going through that transfer function. It's just that equation written there. Okay. And so what we're typically going to do is we're going to design this controller right, to so that U1 contr controls Y1, we're going to do that using this transfer function right here, okay? And then we'll do the same thing down here for U2 and Y2. Measure Y2, compare it to set point, generate an error, controller operates on that, sends a signal to try to control this, okay? So we'll use this transfer function here that relates Y2 and U2 to design the controller. But you can see the problem here is that in the design that we're going to do where I use this transfer function to design that controller and that transfer function to design that controller, I'm just going to pretend like these transfer functions don't exist. Okay? Because, you know, th there's better and more advanced ways to do this, but this is typical engineering approach, right? I already taught you how to design a controller with one input and one output, so if I give you 100 outputs and 100, it, this is a little extreme, but... <laughs> Okay, let's be less extreme. Five inputs and five outputs, then you're going to pair them together and just do the same thing five times, right? That's how, engineer, that's how engineers do things. All right, but you have to be cognizant of the fact that U1 not only affects Y1, but it affects Y2 through this transfer function. U2, unfortunately, affects Y2 through this one, and this is where pro the problems begin, okay? So this is one option. Use U1 to control Y1. Here's the other option, which is use U2 to control Y1 and what did I not say? U1 to control Y1? <laughs> Sorry. U1 to control Y2 and U2 to control Y1. Okay. So the only difference here is you can see we switch how we, the air signals here. So the air signal we generate for Y1 instead of being an input for this controller, which generates U1, it's an input for this controller, which generates Y2. Okay. And the air for Y2 is the input for this controller that, that controls U1. That changes U1, I should say. All right, so we call this, we call this the 1-1-2-2 one, one, two, two pairing, meaning Y1 and U1 are paired together, and Y2 and U2 are paired together, and this is, the, this is the only other option, right? There's only two options here. All right, so one of the questions we're going to try to ask, which of these two is better, okay? And we're going to answer this question according to the properties of these transfer functions, which I'll show you, I'll show you next time. But now, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have this thing plugged in. But now I can show you 
Well, I thought I could, but I guess I can't. When do I get to the meat? I'm going the wrong direction. <laughs> Sorry. I too have not been getting much sleep. All right. All right, so now I'm going to show you the, the problem that I already kind of alluded to, the interaction of these controllers. I'll, I'll illustrate in more detail here. There are the words to back it up, but I'll, I'll just say it without going through these bullets, but I will do the first bullet. So let's say you're operating this system, right? So you're using this, this input to control that output and this input to control that output. And let's say you're running along and both these outputs are at their respective steady state values and everything's great and system is working well. Okay. Then at some point, even though not shown here, right, the plant's subject to some disturbances and let's say that there's a disturbance that causes this output here to deviate from its set point. Okay. So if that's the case, you'll generate an error signal that's not zero and the controller will change U1 as a result, right? And U1 will do what you want, hopefully. It'll affect Y1 through this transfer <coughs> function. That's how it's going to be designed, as I'll show you later, and that's what you want it to do. But unfortunately, U1 will also affect Y2 through that transfer function. Okay? And that'll cause Y2 to deviate from its set point. Okay? And because of that, you understand this Y2 is going to deviate from its set point, not because there's a disturbance down here, because there's a disturbance up here. And this controller has propagated the disturbance down there. Okay? All right, so now Y2 deviates from its set point. You generate a non-zero error signal here. U2 changes, which is good to the extent that that hopefully will cause Y2 to go back to its set point. But unfortunately, that change in U2 will propagate up to Y1 through this transfer function. And you see this circuitous route here in the bold? This is kind of a, a hidden feedback system, if you will. And if this, if this um, disturbance through this complex pathway here somehow gets amplified, this whole thing might even be unstable, right? So this is what we have to watch out for, is um, how these controllers interact and try to somehow minimize their action. You can see one thing right away that if either of these two transfer functions was zero, you'd be golden, right? Because this whole path wouldn't <coughs> exist. But typically they won't be. Okay, so this is the problem and we've got to do some, some work to try to avoid, well, minimize the effect of this, this problem. It's kind of an inherent effect, it's not so much you can do. All right, so now I'm going to do a little analysis as usual for that particular scenario there. So see if you agree with me on this one. Go back to my picture. Let's say that this, this controller here, I think that's what I did, right? I'm going to backtrack here. Yes. This controller here is in manual. You know, so if I tell you a controller is in manual and you're dealing with the PLOS transforms, that means this thing is zero. It's turned off. It's not on. Okay? So I tell you controller is, is in manual, it means it's zero. Okay? So if this controller is zero, that means this pathway doesn't exist. Right? Do you understand what it means to be in, in manual? It means you have these two controllers, you just turn this controller off. It's not controlling now. Okay? It's not doing anything. This controller's on, and so in this case, the, the transfer function between Y1 and U1 is nothing but this thing here. Okay? That's because, I'll explain in a minute, this other path doesn't exist, obviously, if this is zero, because there's a zero right there. This would be good, right? Because that's what you wish the relationship between Y1 and U1 was, because you're going to design this controller using that transfer function. So that's good. So in other words, if this one's turned off, you should be okay. Well, that's... Hopefully you can understand this problem. If, if I have this system here, <laughs> I should be able